We're happy to have you all with us. I should say that this is the 43rd webinar on contemporary anti-Semitism that our Institute has put on over the last year and a half. Um, we now reach sizable numbers of people in many different countries. We do plan to continue uh, after a bit of a pause. So feel free to get in touch with Gunter and with me about any suggestions you might have for focusing future webinars. I'm especially delighted that we're being joined as a kind of co-sponsor this time around by an exciting and newly emerging center, London Center for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, David Hirsch, Philip Spencer, David Seymour, and some other colleagues there are putting that together and we look forward to ongoing collaboration with you. Uh, the more attention we can all, the more serious attention we can all devote to this subject, the better. Uh, our speakers today uh, are not new. Uh, they've both, in fact, been with us in previous programs, so I'll introduce them only very briefly. Uh, Philip Spencer taught for a number of years at Kingston University. Much of the focus of his work during the years he was a professor there was on nationalism, Holocaust, and genocide studies. He established a notable center for the study of mass violence at Kingston University. He's a trustee of the Wiener Library, the Holocaust Library, and has written quite extensively on these subjects to mention just a few of his notable publications. The book Genocide Since 1945, followed by Nations and Nationalism, sorry, preceded by Nations and Nationalism. More recently, a book called Antisemitism and the Left on the Return of the Jewish Question. And he's currently writing a book on cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism and antisemitism. Uh, Marlena uh, originates in Germany, but has lived in Vienna now for quite a while. She studied political science, philosophy, history, and Jewish studies at the universities of Vienna, also for a time at the University of Maryland with Jeffrey Herf in this country. She is one of the editors of an important Vienna-based German language journal dedicated to social and cultural analyses in the tradition of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. Most importantly, she is the editor of a just recently published book with Indiana University Press called Jean Amery, Essays on Antisemitism and Zionism and the Left, a volume that's a must read for anyone interested in these subjects. The subject they're going to discuss today, as Gunter briefly mentioned, has to do with how the Holocaust is remembered faithfully or not among people today. As it happens next week, we will observe Yom HaShoah, the day set aside every year. In fact, we're commemorating the millions of people who were persecuted and slaughtered under the Nazi regime. It may well be the most copiously documented crime in history. We certainly don't lack for sources of knowledge about it, but how those sources today get picked up, interpreted, misinterpreted to serve certain social and political agendas is another matter. And that's going to form the focus of our two presentations and the discussion to follow. Philip, it's now my pleasure to hand over to you and then to Marlene. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Alvin. Thanks very much, Gunther. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking alongside you, Marlena. And thank you, Alvin, for mentioning the new center that David Hirsch and myself and David Seymour and others are trying to put together in London. It may become obvious as I speak why we think such a center is necessary. 
Um, but please do get in touch with us, anybody, if you want to find out more about what we're trying to do. Um, the memory of the Holocaust has been the focus of political debate from right from the beginning. And anti-Semitism has never been far from that. Uh, from that. To begin with, most obviously, there was denial. Largely confined for a long time, mostly to the far right, which claims that the Holocaust never happened and that those Jews who insisted it did were perpetrating a hoax. But also there's been distortion, largely in the form of a slightly different claim that the Holocaust did happen, but was nothing like as bad as Jews claimed and claimed for their own malign purposes. Or that it was indeed bad, but no worse and perhaps not even as bad as other crimes. The first version of this argument came from the right in the 1980s. And I'll briefly say something about it, about what we could perhaps call relativization mark one. It was asserted at that time that before the Holocaust took place, there was as bad or worse a crime committed before the Nazis by the Soviets. What the historian Urs Nolte called the primary Asiatic deed to which the Holocaust was best understood as a response, as a secondary phenomenon. At the same time, Nolte and others claimed that a disproportionate focus on what was done to Jews blocked recognition for what was done to the Germans by this first set of criminals to and on the East. At the time, in the 1980s, this line of argument was fiercely opposed by the left especially by those in the 1968 generation and its most preeminent thinker, Jürgen Habermas. And full disclosure here, I think of myself as part of that generation. It is therefore more than ironic, and I would say tragic, that a new version of this argument is coming not now primarily from the right, but from within a section of the left itself. And it is this new version that I want to focus on here today. It's been gathering force, momentum and appeal for some time. It's an argument that its proponents seek to distinguish from the right, from that advanced by the right, by proclaiming their anti-racism and their universalism against the xenophobic racism of the right, which is undoubtedly and certainly there. But actually, in my view, it is deeply flawed, dangerous, and even reactionary in at least three basic respects. Firstly, because it recycles anti-Semitic tropes and re-articulates re anti-Semitism for a new generation and a new constituency on the left. Secondly, it is inadequate and inconsistent in its anti-racism. At best, it only sees part of what is so awful about anti-Semitism. At worst, it pretends that anti-Semitism no longer exists at the very moment it is again so clearly on the rise, and not least from this quarter. And thirdly, because it undermines universalism itself, particularly in terms of how we might respond now today to the very crime that it claims Holocaust memory blocks, namely the crime of genocide, the crime of crimes. That this is happening in Germany, for example, right now is obviously extremely dismaying, and Marlena will talk about it in much more detail. But it is not unconfined at all to that country. It is a much more widespread argument and is coming to form, in my view, part of what passes for common sense on a significant part of the left, and especially that part which claims, or I would say pretends, to be radical. It's an argument which has been developed by a, a large number of scholars for some time, stretching back to over at least 30 years, and is now becoming increasingly influential. And I want to try and sketch it out before I go through it in more detail. It is inscribed within an overarching framework within which all of this has taken place. And it's what I would describe as essentially anti-imperialist because it focuses heavily, exclusively in fact, 
on the very real and appalling crimes committed by Western states over several centuries. These crimes began, according to this line of argument, with the conquest of the Americas by the Spanish and Portuguese, and then the invasion and subsequent exploitation of much of the rest of the world by Britain, by France, by Holland, by Belgium, by Germany, from Africa to Asia to Australasia. Within this overarching framework, it is claimed that we need to locate the Holocaust as only one among very many crimes committed by the West. The anti-Semitism that was adopted by the Nazis was on this account no different to the more general racism that accompanied and justified Western imperialism everywhere. Because the Holocaust was on this line of argument, essentially and centrally, a part of a much more general German and Nazi imperialist project. There are, however, two important differences between what the Nazis were doing and what the rest of the West was doing. The first is that the Nazi imperialist project was focused not on continents outside Europe, on peoples outside Europe, but on regions and peoples within it, notably in the East, which is, according to this argument, not at all coincidentally, therefore when the mass, where the mass killing of Jews took place. And secondly, the crime was committed against other Europeans, or, is, or as is now being increasingly argued, against other white people. So it can be thought about, and indeed many people say it needs to be thought about, as a white on white crime. But this approach is supposed to yield also further insights into how and why the Holocaust is remembered the way it is. Firstly, not as it should have been, as an imperialist crime among many others, as a European catastrophe, but rather as something quite unique, to be placed on a pedestal, cut off from and thus blocking recognition of other related and connected crimes committed by the West. And secondly, at the same time, as a paradoxical justification for and shield behind which the West can continue to commit crimes. How so? Because after the Holocaust, it is argued, the West has supposedly reintegrated its Jews, who've now apparently become white. And the West did so, not by acknowledging its responsibility for the Holocaust, but by allowing Jews and encouraging Jews to take their part in the continued history of Western imperialism. Above all, by settling and colonizing Palestine, just as the West violently settled and colonized so many other parts of the world expropriating, exploiting, and murdering indigenous peoples everywhere it went. In the process then, and not at all accidentally according to this line of argument, anti-Semitism has been exported as a problem away from and out of Europe onto others who were never responsible for it at all, namely the Palestinians. And the memory of the Holocaust is then on this account used and instrumentalized by the West and by Israel, now part of the West, to justify new crimes, which are as bad, if not even worse, than those committed against Jews in the first place. Since the Nakba of the Palestinians is supposedly as bad as, if not worse than, the Holocaust itself. Which means, to complete a perfectly vicious circle, that the victims of genocide, the Jews, have now become the leading perpetrators of genocide themselves. But because of the way the Holocaust is remembered, it is argued, this cannot be said. Now, many people, not just a particular group of scholars, can find this argument quite seductive. It offers an apparently powerful intellectual support for all those who think that the West is responsible for everything that goes on in the world, goes wrong in the world, and that Israel and Zionists are the worst and greatest criminals of today. There is, however, in my view, an awful lot wrong with this argument. And I could be here for a very long time going through what I think are its many flaws and distortions. So I can only summarize a few of them here. At a bare minimum, the flaws in interpreting the Holocaust in this way would include the following. Firstly, 
the Holocaust went far beyond any imperialist ambitions. Jews were not an indigenous people to be exploited. They weren't to be exploited primarily, in fact, although there was slave labor, but to be annihilated by the Nazis. Secondly, killing Jews was not a means to an imperialist end, but an end in itself. It was the absolute priority of the Nazis to be pursued at all costs, even when they were losing the war. Thirdly, although much of the killing was undoubtedly in Eastern Europe, Jews were brought there to be killed from all over Europe, and more would have been brought there from further afield if we look at Nazi plans for North Africa and for Palestine in particular. Fourthly, Nazi anti-Semitism was not, and anti-Semitism is not, exactly the same as other forms of racism, the forms that are justified and accompanied imperialism. Jews were seen by the Nazis not just as an inferior race, but also as super powerful, extremely clever, cunning, a threat to Germany, to the Aryan race, to humanity itself. Nazi anti-Semitism therefore had crucial differences. It was, as Saul Friedlander in particular has argued, redemptive. Only the annihilation of Jews, not their exploitation, not their removal, would suffice. And lastly, it makes little, no sense, to identify Jews in any meaningful way as white, as any white supremacist would tell you. A recent talk by Karen Stogner to this group, I think explained that, so I won't repeat her arguments here. There is then the general, the whole question of how the Holocaust is supposed to block recognition of other crimes committed by the West, in which Israel is now supposed to be included. Here the interpretation is, in my view, not just flawed, but actually draws on some key anti-Semitic tropes and generates quite reactionary political implications. Let me briefly try to explain. Firstly, as a matter of historical fact, the world's immediate reaction to the Nazis was not on what was done to the Jews or to put Jews on a pedestal. On the contrary, considerable efforts at Nuremberg, for example, were made to downplay what was done to Jews, to keep it out, though not wholly successful. When this attempt at suppression failed, as some, though by no means all of the horror began to come out, what followed, above all, was the Genocide Convention. But this is not at all best understood in terms of the Holocaust being used to ignore other crimes. If you look at the, the terms of the convention that was passed in December 1948, it defined the crime of genocide in two crucial ways that quite clearly did not restrict us from responding only to the Holocaust. Firstly, for all its flaws, and I don't have time to rehearse them here, the convention stated that genocide could happen if any of the following groups were targeted for destruction. National groups, ethnic groups, racial groups, or religious groups. And secondly, the convention said that genocide involved the attempt to target a group in whole or in part. Now it could have restricted itself to a crime committed only against the group that was all of those groups, like the Jews or only when the attempt was to annihilate the whole group, as was done to the Jews, but it didn't. So actually the Holocaust launched an extraordinary project, which was to take a crime that had not been named before and take it seriously. Now it's certainly the case that the world, and by no means not only the West, has responded to very few cases of genocide. This is not because the Holocaust was placed on a pedestal, but for quite different reasons, which we can go into discussion, into the discussion if you like. But emphatically, not because anyone cares more about Jews than others. What then of the argument that the Holocaust is used by Jews to justify them committing genocide themselves? Well, this is such an appalling argument, one feels disinclined to waste any time on it, but by no stretch of the imagination, can one argue that Israel has committed or is committing genocide against the Palestinians? If you want to find serious examples of genocidal intent in that part of the world, it's quite openly expressed by Israel's enemies, by Hamas, by Hezbollah, by Iran, to give only a few examples. What we have here is a classic case of projection. 
of the kind that in their different ways Sartre and Horkheimer and Adorno long ago pointed to. What anti-Semites want to do to Jews, they claim Jews want to do to them, and that justifies them. Now these are such flawed arguments that you might be forgiven if you thought I was exaggerating or making them up. But they are becoming, as I said, increasingly influential, particularly to judge by the appearance and reception of some recent work by one of the leading genocide scholars of today, Dirk Moses, the editor of a major journal of genocide studies, the editor of major compilations of writings on genocide, the author of a new book, as well as a contributor to the catechism debate in Germany, which I suspect Marlene will talk about. In his book, which I have to say, and I'll choose my words carefully here, is probably the worst book I have read in a long time, the most shocking and appalling book. Moses has developed his argument in ways that seem to me to reproduce and rest on key anti-Semitic tropes. I cannot say whether he does this deliberately. I know that he has furiously rebutted any such suggestion, and like Queen Elizabeth I, I do not have a window into men's souls. But this is quite a familiar response to those of us who have spent the last few years pointing out how a significant section of the radical left has dabbled in anti-Semitic discourse, colluded with it, facilitated it, and encouraged it. I think I spoke about this at an earlier session here, if some of you may remember. Now, I don't have time to go into many of the distortions and false arguments that Moses makes. But only time to briefly highlight what seemed to me in this context three particularly and important and dangerous ones. The first is that he argues that it wasn't an accident that the Holocaust was, as he claims, like others, put on a pedestal and used, as he puts it, to screen out recognition of other crimes committed by the West. On the contrary, he says in the book, it was the successful outcome of a deliberate project crafted by the main advocate for the concept of genocide, the Polish Jew Raphael Lemkin, and those he identifies as his fellow Zionists. Secondly, he claims that one of the most serious, indeed the most central of the crimes so screened out was that of states engaging in violent population transfers. And he claims that those violent population transfers carried out by Zionists provided a template for many other states, illiberal ones and liberal ones, to pursue in what in what he calls the fantasy of a project of permanent security. It's a fantasy because rightly it can never be fully achieved. And thirdly, he claims that while he grants that the Nazi fantasy had paranoid elements, they shouldn't be seen to be completely crazy in at least two respects. One is they could even be un understood as anti-colonial in as much as the Nazis believed that the Jews had colonized Germany itself. And it's not wholly clear whether or not he thinks there's some truth to this belief, by the way. But another is that in their fear of Jews, Nazis attributed to Jews a global power, but they were not the only ones to think this. Others in the UK, in the United States, and elsewhere also thought this. And he suggests at one point that some Jews also believed this, the Jews had global power. And that those Jews who did so fatally overreached themselves and their gamble, as he puts it, backfired. If so, one could even conclude that the Jews might even, to some extent, have brought the Holocaust onto themselves. I think that these arguments, myself, need to be understood as re-articulations of some classic anti-Semitic tropes of a kind that the late Robert Fine and I tried to identify in our book that Alvin mentioned on the return of the Jewish question on anti-Semitism in the world. And in particular, the following. The Jews always make too much of their own suffering here in the Holocaust. The Jews exaggerate the extent of anti-Semitism or even invent it where, where it does not after the Holocaust has exist, since it can't because Jews are now white. The Jews engage in special pleading about the Holocaust to advance their own interests at the expense of others who are the ones who really deserve sympathy. The Jews instrumentalize the Holocaust as a central part of a global and local conspiracy to thwart the forces of progress. 
And in some, that Jews behaving badly again after the Holocaust is what causes anti-Semitism. So it is understandable and even progressive that people become anti-Semitic because of the way Jews behave. Now, this re-articulation seems to me very dangerous for Jews, despite or perhaps even because it is the firm belief of those who advance them that they are quite distinct from and opposed to earlier right-wing anti-Semitic attacks on the memory of the Holocaust. But, and I want to end there on this, this distortion of Holocaust memory is also, in my view, quite reactionary despite the firm belief of those who advance this line of argument, that they are progressive and radical. It is reactionary because in its, an obsession, in its obsession with Western imperialism and the central role that Jews have supposedly come to play in it, it can lead people to ignore fatally the very crime committed against Jews in the Holocaust and the, the crime that, that the threat that that poses both to the group the Jews in that case, but also to humanity itself. Holocaust memory is vital both to Jews and to humanity because humanity is essentially diverse. What the Nazis tried to do in assaulting the Jews and seeking to annihilate the Jews was to refashion humanity at the same time by eliminating the Jews. If they succeeded, humanity would no longer have been what it once was. And every genocide, and that's why the convention matters so much, every genocide has the same implication. It is a threat to the group, and it is a threat to humanity. And what the anti-imperialist approach to the Holocaust in its preoccupation only with the West leaves out are the very many genocides that have been threatened and committed by non-Western states because it is entirely obvious that Western imperialism is not the source of all of the evils in the world today, nor has it ever been. There have always been other empires, and we are currently witnessing one at work right now in the Russian assault on the Ukraine. And if you compile a list of the cases of the crime of crime genocide, and I wrote a book about it that I mentioned, the crimes that have been committed, the genocides that have been committed since the Holocaust, They've been committed very largely, not by the West, but by many others, many of which have presented themselves as anti-imperialists. That's not to say that Western imperialists have not played a role in it, but they have in a number of cases, in Guatemala and Indonesia, for example. But they are not the only, or in my view, prime suspects. So, to conclude, what we urgently need, and this argument prevents us doing it, is a greater willingness to respond both to a resurgent anti-Semitism and to genocide wherever the threat is coming from. We can't do this. We focus myopically only on the West. We can't do this if we blame Jews for everything that has gone wrong. From crafting a, de a, definition, a definition of genocide that suits only Jews and the West to Jews being identified quite falsely as the greatest criminals of all today. What we have here has best been defined by the late moisture of stone, in fact, as the anti-imperialism of fools. It is myopic, it is incoherent, it is inconsistent, and it is only superficially radical. And like all forms of superficial radicalism, it is inherently anti-Semitic. Thank you. Should I just go next? Okay. Yes, please, Malin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to speak today about dealing with the past in Germany and recent attempts to empty the Holocaust of anti Semitism and downplay anti Semitism in general. Not by the political right, as one might assume, but by the mainstream and the left and not by malicious intent, but by meaning to do good. German memory culture often is believed to be a success story. Today, the Holocaust and other Nazi crimes are addressed in political speeches, in TV programs, and at memorials. 
Jean Emery, who was persecuted as a Jew and survived Auschwitz and other concentration camps, agonized over the fact that he was harboring a deep resentment against the Germans, even as a new generation was growing up. He pled for the young Germans to, quote, break with their fathers, end of quote. But this is not at all what has happened since he wrote these words in the 1960s. The generation of 68 claimed to have broken with their parents in Germany, but what they did ideologically and sometimes even violently was to now support the Palestinian case against Israel. <clears throat> Even when leaving this new guise of the anti-Semitic tradition aside, it becomes clear that the Nazi inheritance was not renounced, neither regarding the economy, in the sense that without the war, the economic miracle would not have been possible, and German companies still profit today from expropriation, slave labor, and inhuman experiments, nor regarding a moral gain that was to be extracted from the history of Nazism. Breaking with the fathers, according to Améry, would mean to be irreconcilable with the past. He appealed to the descendants of the perpetrators and basically to everyone in general that they may resist a utilization of the Holocaust, a positive incorporation, which then reconciles with the past after all. It seems today as if left liberal Germans were glad that the Holocaust happened not because they are saying the Holocaust was right, that's the matter of a few diehard neo-Nazis who by no means constitute a majority, but because they are incorporating the Holocaust for a renewed and better Germany. Not despite the Holocaust, but because of it, Germans feel proud of their nations, of their nation. The German Jewish philosopher Theodor Adorno suggested, following the insights of Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, that the extreme collective narcissism in Germany was damaged by the military defeat and the temporary Allied occupation. The Germans had experienced a massive narcissistic insult. The individuals of the collective had not been aware of this insult and consequently never came to terms with it. Adorno writes that the collective narcissism was not destroyed in 1945, but has continued to exist in the democratic post-war German society. It has been lying in wait to be repaired so that finally one can be proud again of something in common as Germans. In 2005, the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe was inaugurated in Berlin. Former Chancellor Gerhard Schröder of the Social Democratic Party, SPD, publicly stated it was a memorial, quote, which one enjoys going to. The historian Eberhard Jeckel said at the Bürgerfest, which literally translates to a celebration for the citizens, on the fifth anniversary of the monument's existence, I quote, in other countries, many people envy the Germans this monument. We can walk upright again because we've been upright. That is the point of this monument and that is what we are celebrating." End of quote. If one is looking for a striking example to illustrate the positive incorporation of the Holocaust, this is it. During the immediate post-war years, the past in Germany was dealt with through silence. Only later, when the persons concerned, the perpetrators and the immediate profiteers had already passed away and no one could be unpleasantly affected, the now numerous memorials were built and political speeches given. The question is, why were they built and held now? For the victims or for the Germans themselves? Would any survivors of the Holocaust agree that the point of the memorial in Berlin was for the Germans to be able to walk upright again? Surely the horrible fate of the victims is constantly emphasized. Dead Jews are mourned in political speeches and ceremonies. But the living ones, when it comes down to it, receive support only when it somehow serves Germany's reputation. In the case of Israel, 
the state that is a refuge to Jews all over the world and that can defend itself militarily against anti-Semites without having to rely on the goodwill of others, German politicians claim that Israel's existence was a raison d'etat. And yet, Germany cares more about its economic ties with Iran. The fact that the Islamic regime is expanding its nuclear program, which poses a significant threat to Israel, does not deter German politicians and entrepreneurs from being the European Union's largest trading partners for the anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers in Tehran. At the United Nations, Germany regularly abstains or votes against Israel. Germany is the second largest sponsor of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees, <clears throat> which is to name just one problem, running schools that propagate hatred against Jews and support terrorist attacks against Israeli civilians. Only the Germans, however, seem to know how to commemorate the Holocaust appropriately. Sabine Müller, a correspondent of the public service television network ARD, claimed in a commentary for Tagesschau, the most watched news program in Germany, that the ceremony at Yad Vashem to commemorate the liberation of Auschwitz in January 2020 was, quote, unconvincing. While German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier had done everything right, Israel had, quote, hijacked the day of remembrance. What kind of a never again is this? The bare minimum that memory of the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews, and coming to terms with this past has to bring about is that Jews today can live safely and in peace. But according to a recent survey, more than half of Germany's Jewish population has directly experienced anti-Semitic harassment. When speaking about the Holocaust in Germany, anti-Semitism often is addressed at best on a superficial level. No one likes to be called an anti-Semite today. It would be cause for a bad reputation. Many times the Holocaust comes down to man's inhumanity to man. Norman Goda recently pointed out, referencing the novelist Dara Horn, that dead Jews are only worth discussing if they are part of something bigger, something more. The something more would be man's inhumanity to man. This also holds true for the current situation in Germany. Johanna Herzing, editor at Deutschlandfunk, a public broadcasting radio station, wrote on the occasion of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, I quote, the victims show us what it's all about when we remember today. It's about human life, about human community and human behavior. It's about the essence of being human, about humanity itself, end of quote. Antisemitism as the core of Nazi ideology and actions with its redemptive dimension, which Philip already mentioned, that distinguishes it from racism and other forms of hatred is ignored. Jews as a distinctive group of victims are leveled down to an abstract concept of victims that can include everyone and everything. The intention of the murderers in this kind of thinking is brushed aside. The past in Germany has not been confronted in a way that could be painful to the Germans themselves. The majority of Germans does not deny that the Nazis committed atrocious crimes, but the Nazis are almost always seen as a small group of people no one knows personally. This false image also seems to have been confirmed by the judiciary in post-war Germany. According to the historian Mary Fulbrook, all trials in the Federal Republic until 2005 taken together, only 6,656 people were sentenced. Of these, only a fraction was imprisoned for more than two years. Barely anyone asks on a personal level where the money comes from that is inherited today. Members of the SS and Wehrmacht 
still receive payments from the German state as they are considered victims of the war. The payments were and are spent and taken gladly. While the countries in Eastern Europe still suffer from the long-term consequences of the Second World War, and Israel is constantly threatened of being wiped off the map, people in Germany lead a carefree life in prosperity. Two years ago, the German language translation of Susan Neyman's book with the striking title, Learning from the Germans, was published. The philosopher and director of the Potsdam Einstein Forum said in an interview with the newspaper Neue Zürcher Zeitung, not ironically, but seriously, quote, Germany has achieved a master stroke. That's what people like to hear in Germany. And so Neyman was highly praised in the feuilleton and in the German mainstream media. In her book, Neyman compares the way the Holocaust was dealt with in Germany and the way slavery was dealt with in the United States. The central argument is that Germany is a role model that others should follow. Again, not despite of the Holocaust, but because of it, the Germans should feel especially proud. It's particularly perfidious that Neyman prefixes learning from the Germans with a quote by Jean Amery. She ignores Amery's irreconcilability with post-war Germany. In its place, she puts understanding and sympathy for the Germans. In the prologue, she writes, I quote, Americans who read these pages will learn how agonizingly difficult it was for Germany to take on the burden of its shameful history. End of quote. According to Neyman, the Germans had a hard lot. What the murdered Jews had burdened them with, she understands as torment. Yet she certainly sees something good in it, namely that the German nation can finally find itself. She writes, quote, shame is the first step towards a real national self-awareness, end of quote. This again is a striking example of the positive incorporation of the Holocaust. In other respects too, Neyman, who immigrated to Germany from the US, fits the typical new German tone. In a commentary in the weekly quality newspaper Die Zeit, she slammed an article by the columnist Maxime Villa on the contemporary virulence of anti-Semitism. Villa described how Israel bashing has advanced from the 68 generation to the German mainstream. Neyman finds Villa's observation, quote, outrageous. In her response, she claims that Israel acts like a colonial power. She says that the, quote, urge to label Israel bashing as anti-Semitic is only a means to deflect reasonable criticism, end of quote. In 2020, Neyman was one of the most prominent supporters of Achille Mbembe. It's no surprise that the director of the Einstein Forum sympathizes with the Cameroonian post-colonial philosopher who also imagines Israel as a colonial state. The debate about Mbembe in Germany started with an intervention by the politician Lorenz Deutsch of the Liberal Party FDP against the invitation of Mbembe as the opening speaker at the Ruhr Triennale Music and Arts Festival. He called on the director of the festival, Stephanie Karp, to disinvite Mbembe due to his anti-Zionist views and support of the BDS movement. Soon, also the German government's commissioner for the fight against anti-Semitism, Felix Klein, voiced his concerns over Mbembe's invitation to the festival that was funded by public money. A fierce defense of Mbembe and the German media in an open letter in solidarity with him, signed by many acclaimed scholars, ensued. Among them, Alida Asman, Wolfgang Benz, Omar Bartov, Susan Neyman, Michael Rothberg, and Dirk Moses. Mbembe's critics were accused of targeting him primarily for racist reasons. 
By the allegation of anti-Semitism, Mbembe, according to his defenders, was to be illegitimately silenced. Apparently, the allegation of anti-Semitism was seen as a bigger problem than what Mbembe actually said and wrote. Being called out an anti-Semite in Germany raises a bigger uproar than the anti-Semitism itself. His supporters claimed that his comparison of Nazism with colonialism and Israel's policies with South Africa's apartheid regime were justified because one would always compare and comparing does not mean equating. However, this was a bogus argument because none of members' critics in the public debate had objected to comparison as such. The point was that Mbembe was twisting the facts to such an extent that what Israel was doing to the Palestinians was not only just as bad as what happened to the black population in South Africa, which in itself would be a distortion of the historic effects, but Mbembe claims that Israel's policy is, was much worse. In his preface to the anthology Apartheid Israel, the politics of an analogy, Mbembe wrote, I quote, the occupation of Palestine is the biggest moral scandal of our times, one of the most dehumanizing ordeals of the century we have just entered, and the biggest act of cowardice since the last half century." End of quote. Mbembe, like the majority of Germans, does not deny the Holocaust, but he interprets it as, a, as one crime among others and turns it against Israel. In his essay, Israel, the Jews and Us, Mbembe asks how the victims of yesterday have become the persecutors of today, who have allegedly internalized the Holocaust's pathological will to nothingness and taken the place of murderers. Because of the experience of the Holocaust, he later elaborates in an interview about post-colonial thinking, there was a, quote, fetish of the fact of having been a victim in Israel and a God that can only be pacified by killing other victims. While South Africa was never about total extermination, Israel would compulsively spill the blood of others through the desire for reparation. According to Mbembe, quote, the fetish requires endless sacrifices and thus fresh victims killed to appease the sacrificer God." End of quote. Mbembe not only imputes to the Israelis the reintroduction of human sacrifice, but at the same time provides a new edition of the Christian blood libel. He manages to turn the history of persecution of the Jews against them. Because they themselves were persecuted, they allegedly are now bloodthirsty and cannot stop killing others, namely the Palestinians, and offering them a sacrifice to their God. <clears throat> at the very latest, at such statements, at the very latest, at such statements, the anti-Semitism in Bembe's work becomes evident. But Alida Asman, Germany's leading scholar on memory culture was more concerned about the quote, climate of suspicion, insecurity and denunciation because of the work of Felix Klein, which she, which she considered a threat for academic freedom and publicly called for Klein's dismissal. Asman also insisted that a cause for this climate of suspicion was the IRA definition of antisemitism. <clears throat> which includes certain forms of criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. It's no coincidence that she was one of the coordinators of the so-called Jerusalem Declaration, which is supposed to serve as an alternative to the definition by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. The public controversy that started with a debate about Mbembe and his relativization of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism is characterized by some as a second Historikerstreit. Last year, it culminated in the so-called German Catechism by Dirk Moses, 
In it, Moses calls on the Germans to be done with dealing with the Holocaust in order to be more inclusive. Instead of breaking with the fathers, truly breaking with the Nazi tradition, Moses says not to care any longer. I will leave it at that Philip already outlined some of the post-colonial arguments, but, I, but to conclude, I will just say this. The past in Germany has not been dealt with properly. Otherwise, the post-colonial views of the Holocaust and the relativization of antisemitism would not fall on such fruitful grounds. If coming to terms with the past was as, as successful as it is claimed to be, Jews would not have to be afraid. The opposite is the case. <laughs>